So for our journey of Lent, the last several weeks, we have been in the Gospel of Mark. And now we come to Mark's resurrection gospel. It is the shortest of all the gospels, only eight verses. And so later in the message, we'll also see how Paul interprets this good news of the resurrection. Listen to God's word to you. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, once again we read of this first Easter morning. And we pray that you would give us new insight as to what it means in the depths of our hearts that you are raised from the dead. That the tomb is empty. He is not here, but has risen. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the very earliest hours of the first Easter Sunday begins with death. Mark's Gospel says that these three women are going to the tomb that morning fully expecting to encounter a dead body. They're bringing spices in order to anoint the body as well as to prepare the body to prepare it with these spices so it can decompose quickly in this borrowed tomb. And then later that the bones may be taken to an ossuary, a bone box, so that finally it can be properly buried. Yes, Easter begins with death. Jesus died. We are, we're reminded of this on Good Friday in a very meaningful service and message led by Dr. Osborne right here, emphasizing the death of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ. We even say it in the Apostles' Creed, was crucified, dead, and buried. The women knew that Jesus had died. They were there at the crucifixion. They had seen it with their own tearful eyes. And they had witnessed the excruciating pain and endured the terrifying agony. There was nothing that was going to change the gruesome reality of the crucifixion. Jesus was dead. Period. End of story. Or so they thought. Imagine the scene as they are walking together that early first Easter morning. They're carrying spices with them. The sunrise has just happened. 
Their heads are down, still in grief, probably not speaking to a, each other until one of them says, well, who is going to move the stone? And then it says, looking up, they see a young man. There is no mention of any guards in Mark. There's no mention of anybody but this young man who is robed in white, which is traditional language for an angel, and is seated, seated on the right side, it says. Well, that's traditional language for the divine side, the good side, as opposed to the left side or the evil side. It's, Mark tells us that the three women are alarmed at this young man's words. Well, I don't think alarmed is strong enough. I would have said some words like terrified or petrified or scared stiff when he says, He has risen. He is not here. Yes, the first Easter starts with death. But with these seven words, Easter reverses the process. So death becomes resurrection. Where there was a body, now there is no body. Expecting the tomb to be occupied, now it is an empty tomb. He has risen. He is not here. This same claim is made by Paul about 25 to 30 years later in his first letter to the church at Corinth. Listen to God's word to you. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel. I preach to you which you received on which you have taken your stand, by this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. Did you notice that Paul begins this chapter called the Resurrection Chapter, chapter 15, by telling us to hold firmly to the message, the good news by which you and I are saved. And what is that message? Well, they're right there in verses 3 and 4, almost with creedal clarity, that Christ died for our sins, as according to Scripture, that Christ was buried, that Christ was raised on the third day, according to Scripture, and that Christ appeared. Now, Paul goes on to list six different appearances of our Lord. If you want to find others, the Gospels tell of six or seven more appearances 
of the Lord. Paul here says that the Lord appeared to Cephas, which you know is a name for Peter, and it's described in Luke 24. He probably appeared to him very early in that day on Easter. Later in the evening, he appears to the 12. Well, we know that it's only 11 because Judas isn't there. But the 12 is an understood traditional term by this time of the disciples. He appeared to more than 500 at one time. Well, you can read about that in Matthew 28 up in Galilee. He appeared to James. Not the James you might be thinking of. The James who wrote the letter. This is the half-brother of Jesus. The one who did not believe in Jesus before the resurrection. But after the resurrection, he joined this apostle band of believers and became so prominent in his belief that he became one of the leaders of the Christian church in Jerusalem. And then he appeared to the apostles, and then last of all, he appeared to Paul. This is the Easter message of Mark. This is the Easter message of Paul, that Christ died, was buried, was raised, and appeared. I like how one person put it. Easter was the first and only case of one dead body benefiting the whole world by becoming not so dead. As John Donne's famous poem, Death Be Not Proud. You remember you read it in high school? Well, it's on the back of your bulletin just for a reminder for, for you. In that poem, the last line there, And death shall be no more, death thou shalt die. The tomb is empty because death was murdered in that Easter tomb. That is the Easter message that we celebrate and proclaim today and every day. But to get the complete impact of the Easter message, Paul goes even further. For Paul, the message to which we must hold firmly is not only the belief that Christ's resurrection defeated death. Yes, it is that. We, we've been singing about that in the songs that we've heard and sung. We've said it to one another. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We even will sing it at the end of the service with a hallelujah chorus, giving God our praise through Jesus Christ. But Easter is more than that. Paul uses the rest of chapter 15 to explain the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the assurance of our own resurrection. This is Paul's great treatise on how the process of death is reversed in the resurrection of Christ. How the body of Jesus, and someday our bodies as well, will change from our physical body to our spiritual body. We even say it in the Apostles' Creed. We believe in the resurrection of the body. The Easter message is that Christ's resurrection has made everlasting life possible for you and me. The Easter message is that one formerly dead body, Christ's body, has made all the difference in the world by giving hope to the living. I really enjoy how Dr. Fred Craddock, the great Methodist preacher down south in, in Georgia and Alabama, he shares a story about this hope. He tells of a young woman in her 30s who is a vivacious person. Actually, she is a colleague of his. She's a teacher. And one night, she is grading papers in her apartment. She's a single woman. And she hears a knock on the door. And she goes to the door and opens it, and there he stood, 
old death with his yellow face, his bony fingers, and his crooked nose. She slammed the door and she locked it. And she ran to the doctor and he said, malignant. She had surgery and she did pretty well. A few weeks later, she was even back to work. She had lost a little weight, but that was a good thing. And then a few weeks after that, she was again sitting in her apartment, this time watching TV, and she heard the knock at the door. And she went to the door and she opened it, and there was old death with his yellow face. And she slammed the door in his face, and she locked it again. And she ran to the doctor and he said, chemotherapy. The chemo made her very sick. Very sick. She lost all her hair. Her skin turned that strange color. She lost a lot of weight. She was eventually able, however, to go back to work on a limited basis. And then a few weeks later, sitting in her apartment, she heard a knock. And she moved slowly at this time to go to the door. And she opened the door, and there stood old death with that yellow face looking right at her face to face. And she slammed the door, and she tried to lock it, but the lock was broken, and she panicked. And so she called all of her friends and she called her her family down in Florida to, to come up and visit. And these people all came into her living room from time to time, her family and her friends, and they all gathered. And each one of them would lean against the door since the lock didn't work. So they would keep death from coming into that door. Around the clock they stayed there and they leaned against the door to keep them out. Old death will not get into this room. And they waited and they leaned until one night she said in a voice that had a certain calmness to it get away from the door what if we get away from the door it will open and he will come in get away from the door they got away and the door swung open And there was death with that yellow face. But then Dr. Craddock says, old death was embarrassed and defeated, however, because in his left hand was rest, and in his right hand was peace. Old death had been whipped. Death had no dominion over her. Two days later, they assembled in her church and at her request sang these two familiar hymns, O Worship the King, and Now Thank We All Our God. Dr. Craddock said, you should have been there. It was wonderful. It was really, really something how they sang. Friends, a cure for death has been found. It's found in an empty tomb on Easter. This is the good news by which we are saved and to which you and I are to hold firmly. The tomb is empty. He is not here. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Amen.